I'm here in London's Leicester Square for the anticipated return of one of cinema's best-loved superheroes. 19 years after his last movie, today on Spotlight marks the return of Superman. Coming up in the next half hour, I'll be talking exclusively to Brandon Routh about filling Superman's trunks. I, I'm, I'm more busy than I was then. <laughs> get to travel a lot more. We'll see how they created those amazing special effects as we go behind the scenes. Of course, we'll bring you all the highlights from a glittering UK premiere. I want to know it all, everything. Olsen, I want to see photos of him everywhere. No, I want the photos. Travel. Where did he go? Was he on vacation? If so, where? Gossip. Has he met somebody? Fashion. Is that a new suit? Uh, health. Has he gained weight? What's he been eating? Business. How is this going to affect the stock market? Long term? Short term? Politics. Does he still stand for truth? Justice. All that stuff. Lifestyle. Superman Returns. Superman Returns is one of this year's most expensive films, but it wasn't the reputed $200 million budget that was raising eyebrows. Instead, it was the choice of unknown actor Brandon Routh for the film's leading role. Not that the cast had any doubts. The first time I saw Brandon in the suit, it was, I think I actually let out an audible scream. We walked in and there was this guy and he was six foot four, five, whatever it was and you literally had to look up to see him. And it was still an early version of the costume, it wasn't finished, but it was mind-blowing because it was Superman. There was no doubt. You revert back to a child. To, you can't look at this person in the eye because it's too, it's, it's like meeting Santa Claus. And Brandon is, I mean, you look at the guy and you think, oh my God, that guy looks just like Superman. It was amazing how much he looked like Christopher Reeve. Uh, when we're just, you know, standing on set and just hanging out and talking, and, and then you actually see when the cameras start rolling and he kind of turns into Clark Kent. It's really amazing. Because <laughs> it, it is that, that same sort of bumbling, um, awkward, nerdy character that we've come to love, certainly from the Christopher Reeve performance. So, there, I, you know, I think people are going to get in their Superman what they really want. He wrote that the world doesn't need a savior, but every day I hear people crying for one. The film's plot sees Superman return to Earth after five years searching for his home planet, Krypton. Five years. If your father was alive, he never would have let you go. I almost gave up hope. I, I just thought I would never see you again. Oh, Clark. Did you find what you were looking for? I saw it. Hoped. It might still be there. You're home. That place was a graveyard. I'm all that's left. Clark, the universe is a big place. And you don't know who's out there. And even if you are the last, you're not alone. There's a big shock in store for him, though, when he finds out that times and the love in his life have moved on. He's never really had a really challenging um, emotional obstacle. And so something that we wanted to throw at him was the idea of, well, what if he came back and Lois Lane is in love with somebody else? And not just that, but she... Uh, she's angry that he left. And uh, for us, there'd be nothing stronger or more devastating to him than to be told by the woman that he loves that he's no longer relevant in the world. Ha! <laughs> yeah. He looks just like his mom. Already takes after her, too, especially when it comes to getting into trouble. <laughs> Mother. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you've been gone. Fearless reporter Lois Lane is a mommy. She was essentially in love with him, and then he disappeared, and now she starts to reconcile that personally. So like the good reporter, instead of uh, internalizing it and venting about it, she writes about it. 
And instead of saying, why I don't need Superman, she sort of replaces it with why the world doesn't need Superman. She thinks she doesn't need to be saved ever, you know, and uh, she, um, she'll just take care of things on her own. She's very independent, she's very driven, very strong-willed, which can be slightly frustrating for the men in her life. I moved on, so did the rest of us. That's why I wrote it. The world doesn't need a savior, and neither do I. Of course she needs Superman, she misses him, but in his absence she needs someone else. Uh, he's a uh, handsome guy, he's a confident guy, he's a pilot, he flies, he's, he's James Marsden. You know, Lois, uh, that article that you wrote... Why the world doesn't need Superman? No, 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 the other one from years ago before we met. Well, which article? I wrote dozens about him. I was practically his press agent. I spent the night with Superman. Richard, come on. It was the title of an interview. Plus, it was your Uncle Perry's idea. I, no, 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 I know, I know, it's okay, it's okay. Richard, it's a long time ago. Were you in love with him? <laughs> he was Superman. Everyone was in love with him. But were you? For Superman, there are some things that will never change, and that means being plagued by his old adversary, Lex Luthor. What's wrong? Lois and Jason are missing. I have advanced alien technology. And what better baddie to play than the nemesis of the greatest superhero of all time? Do you know the story of Prometheus? No, of course you don't. Prometheus was a god who stole the power of fire from the other gods and gave control of it to mortals. In essence, he gave us technology, he gave us power. So we're still in fire? In the Arctic? Actually, sort of. You see, whoever controls technology controls the world. The Roman Empire ruled the world because they built roads. The British Empire ruled the world because they built ships. America, the atom bomb, and so on and so forth. I just want what Prometheus wanted. Sounds great, Lex. But you're not a god. Gods are selfish beings who fly around in little red capes and don't share their power with mankind. No! I don't want to be a god. I just want to bring fire to the people. And I want my cut. I'll have advanced technology. Well, before I read the script, Brian talked to me uh, about um, that it was going to be darker and that in particular Lex Luthor was going to be um, a character who wasn't quite the used car salesman, uh, but more of somebody who's gone through so many changes and, and been, uh, feels that he's been so betrayed that he's now out for revenge. Come on, let me hear you say it just once. You're insane. No! <laughs> no, the other thing. Kevin's such a great villain. I mean, he really, he's, he's, uh, he's, he plays it so well because he doesn't, He's so multi-layered and funny. I think that's the key of having a good villain is that Kevin is so funny as well. Um, and, and so it was a real, real pleasure for me to really watch him play something so different. Superman will run! on Superman Returns after the break when I'll be joined by the stars right here on the red carpet. Plus, I'll be talking exclusively to the man who's trying to fill Superman's boots. Hello, 
and welcome to today's Spotlight on Superman Returns. We're here in London for the film's UK premiere. Later on, I'll be chatting to the likes of Kevin Spacey as well as the man that everybody's talking about, Brandon Ralph. London's Leicester Square was packed with fans dressed in red and blue, hoping to get a glimpse of the latest Man of Steel, Brandon Ralph. For once, this superhero decided on a more humble means of arrival. The fans showed their appreciation to cast and crew as they gave them an undeniable thumbs up for this latest incarnation. Let's start with the big question. Earlier in the day, I got the chance to talk to the film's cast about the phenomenon of Superman and find out whether Brandon had adjusted to his new role of Hollywood superstar. Now, although the thrill of it has probably died down a little bit, cast your mind back and just tell me, um, how did it feel to be told that you were the new Superman, the, the embodiment of the perfect man? <laughs> well, uh, it was a, it was a, a, big, uh, a big relief uh, for me and, and I was very happy and called my parents and they were extremely happy and, and all that. But like you say, yeah, it was a big relief because I had been involved with the casting process for, for seven months. So I'd had a lot of time to think about what it was like and, and all that stuff was great. I was uh, really excited about the potential and so um, it, was, it was absolutely very happy. Superman himself, uh, with everything, with Christopher Reeve, with the costume, it's such an iconic image and character. Uh, how much did you want your version of Superman to be like an ode to him and how much did you want to make it your own? Well, I knew that, that some of it would be there inherently just because, first of all, just my presence and my, my physical likeness to him uh, was going to uh, allow for, for a similarity, which was nice to help audiences um, make the transition from, from, that, from those films to this film because we're sharing the same universe, you want to have a similar feel. So his spirit and his energy, I think, is, 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 a, is a part of me as I, as I play the character. Um, and, and that's pretty much the extent of it. I mean, we did throw in a little homage to pushing up the, the glasses with the forefinger, which was, which was a pur purposeful thing. So tell me about the, um, the physicality of it, you know, how you prepared uh, for the role, perhaps some of the hardest aspects of the shoot. The hardest aspect of the shoot really was, was the time it took to shoot. It took so long to, to do this whole thing in five months of pre-production. You know, I, I trained for a year, uh, you know, a, a, probably a little over a year actually, um, but you know, five months before we started filming, five, six days a week, and then all the way through filming, uh, training five, at least five days a week, uh, lifting weights and running and eating healthy the whole time. And just, it's a long time to do that, to get up at four or five in the morning and, and then uh, work out for a couple hours and then shoot for another 12, 14 hours. Now, what's it like putting on that costume? Be honest. I mean, do you feel manly in Lycra? Or did you sort of think, oh, I wish they'd updated it? No, they did update it. <laughs> they did update it. And I tell you what, even though I felt awkward the first time I put the, put the suit on, it wasn't because the suit was awkward. It was because I felt awkward. Um, I was always very happy about the suit and the modifications that they made. It always felt um, uh, like a king's, like a knight's armor uh, to me. Uh, I always felt that it was very powerful, um, especially as I, as I, um, my physique grew, I felt more and more powerful in, in the suit and uh, I really appreciated uh, the ability to wear it. Has life changed after Superman? Certainly, certainly. Uh, you know, I'm talking a lot about myself, more than I did uh, a couple years ago, <laughs> certainly. There's pictures of me everywhere that seem to follow me. Uh, which is which is good. Uh, having my face on posters, um, you know, there's a lot more media attention certainly, um, but that's that's part of it, and it gets it gets the movie out there and and, and my name out there, and um, I, I'm I'm more busy than I was then as well. <laughs> Get to travel a lot more. <laughs> Not fly. No, well, you, flying in planes. <laughs> Brandon's done this before. I told her I'm a frequent flyer. There's nothing to worry about. <laughs> what was it like working with Brandon? Because I've heard he's a real sweetheart. He is such a sweetheart. He really is. He's um. He's so kind and generous and really loyal. Um, he's very much like Superman in that he really will stand up for what he believes in and doesn't have a problem doing it. And uh, he's he's incredibly confident as well. And um, he's just lovely. He's he's such a good good person. Now tell me about some of the. Um more challenging aspects of it. The scene I'm thinking of particularly is that plane scene. You, you're the only one getting thrown I around. know. <laughs> it's kind of unfair, actually. <laughs> it's so funny. Out of all of the action sequences, it's like I somehow find myself in all of them. You know what I mean? Like, other than Superman saving the world, it's like I'm in the plane crash sequence. I'm uh, in the Lex Luthor kidnapping. I'm in the yacht scene in the end. Like, 
Lois always finds herself in these situations. I think we should cut that in the second one. What's the biggest thrill for you being involved in the phenomena that is Superman? Being involved with a film like this, you, you have fans that will come up to you and literally be like, thank you so much for bringing this back. And it means so much to them, which is amazing. Like, I've never seen anything like it. So that's, um, that's pretty neat for me. So, so he'll actually... He made his name as a master of the comic book adaptation after directing the first two X-Men movies and it's a genre that director Brian Singer is more than happy to continue in. It's crystals, magical crystals. Oddly enough, I've never read comics. All my life, I grew up lo uh, loving science fiction, fantasy, I was a Star Trek fan, but comic books, um, I, for some reason, I was not a comic book fan. So now, having delved into the world of comic books and done three adaptations of comic books, I, I kind of I have become somewhat knowledgeable about them, and, uh, and, I, and I am genuinely of the opinion that these comic books, as, as seemingly entertaining and kids-oriented as they are, will become our 20th century mythologies. And how do you think Superman stands within that? Is it the pinnacle of the superhero oh, yeah. movie? He is absolutely, well, he is absolutely the ultimate superhero. He was the first superhero before Superman uh, comic characters didn't have superpowers. He also kind of represents uh, oh, many things, uh, righteousness, he's the ultimate immigrant, he, he has you know, immeasurable powers, strength, he can fly, and uh, he, kind of, he kind of represents also what we aspire to be, you know. And he's also one of the few superheroes that doesn't dress up to be a superhero, that's just him. He, he, he dresses up to be one of us, to be Clark Kent. Now, how do you think um, new visual technologies have sort of <coughs> changed the look and the capabilities of Superman for 2006 audience? Well, they've made a lot of things possible. You know, we can do things that people have never seen before, the audiences haven't seen before. And we can recreate an actor. Um, either we can recreate Brandon right down to the pores on his tongue, or the fibrous hairs on his ears, you know, as Superman, or we can uh, take Marlon Brando, 2D material of Marlon Brando, and have him say things that he never actually said on camera. Oh, so I thought that was just old footage that no. you put in. No, that's completely recreated. He never actually said those lines on camera, particularly in three dimensions like that. <sighs> So what's the biggest thrill for you being involved in a phenomenon, a historical phenomenon such as Superman? I think it's, the, it's those days when I'm feeling stressed out uh, from work, very tiring days, very long days, and then Brandon will walk on the set wearing the full suit, you know, and I'll say, wow, that's Superman. In fact, I had, it was very interesting, George Lucas came to the set and visited and brought his whole family. And, uh, and uh, we had lunch, and then afterwards I, said, I asked them, do you want to meet Superman? And they were like, okay, sure. You know, they're George Lucas's family. They've seen it all. And so we knocked on Brandon's dressing room door, and he came out in the full suit but without the cape, which is very strange looking. Uh, but yet, at the same time, uh, George Lucas's daughters just changed. Mm -hmm. Everything changed, and we brought the cape over and attached it, and then took a, and the cameras came out, and pictures were taken. I mean, you know, you know, so to create... You know, to have a moment like that, you know, and I grew up with Star Wars, I mean, like, you know, you got to pinch yourself every once in a while. Having first teamed up with director Brian Singer for The Usual Suspects 11 years ago, it proved the defining reason for Kevin Spacey to play supervillain Lex Luthor. Were you a comic book fan or a fan of Superman as a kid? I was, I mean, I was, and I, I didn't read comics. I was, um, I was more of a kid who was making model rockets and playing cowboys and Indians. Um, but the truth is, you can't grow up in the United States and not be inundated with the image and the myth of Superman. He's just sort of everywhere. But my first memories of it, really, as a, as a, as a cinematic experience, was the, the Christopher Reeve, 19, you know, the first Donner film. Um, I remember we all were in line that first Friday night, you know, lining up for tickets because well, A, we wanted to see the new Superman, the, the movie, but, but also all of us were drama students and we wanted to see Marlon Brando, who was gonna be in this movie and had been paid more money than anybody in movie history and all this jazz. And now, you know, all these years later, I, I find myself doing a scene with Marlon Brando. It's just you know, strange, very strange. So what's the biggest thrill, you'd say, being involved in a phenomenon like Superman? Uh, for me, the biggest thrill, the biggest reason uh, was Brian Singer, um, you know, People that know his work, either from the two X-Men, the first X-Men movies he directed, or the work we did 11 years ago in The Usual Suspects, I think won't be surprised uh, when they see this movie and see that he's a director who has always been focused on character, no matter what the size of the budget or the, or the genre. 
And so for me, it was like a day hadn't gone by. Um, I trust him completely and just let him guide me through this fun, iconic, silly, and scary character. Now you have played um, the bad guy or the villain um, before in Seven, Usual Suspects. What do you like about exploring this kind of character? Of course, Lex Luthor. Well, I guess it's because it's so completely removed from your own life, you know? I mean, you know, to play a serial killer is, is, is about as far from my own experience as I, as, I, as I hope to God I ever get. Um, so it's sort of interesting to be able to embody something that is completely foreign to you um, or to embody ideas that you completely, absolutely disagree with, but you have to commit to them as if they are so that people believe in the character. When I hear people refer to characters I played in the third person, then I feel like, yeah, I, I did my job because that character, even that character's name, stuck. and. That's a good thing because that means you've maybe you've served the writing, you've served the piece, you've been in the right world. Um, you know, the downside is that sometimes people think you must be like that in order to be able to play it. But that's the great joy of being an actress. You can you can pretend, and if you're lucky, you have a good enough director that makes it look like you got away with it. Whether they truly get away with it will be up to the legions of dedicated comic book fans, but on this reception, it looks as if they already have. What's